this is going to be our last session of the morning, and uh, it's about uh, collaborating on evidence for tax design. So we're going to be hearing about two recent projects, which are collaborations between both internal researchers from revenue authorities and external researchers. So the first project we're going to be hearing about is made in Uganda, and then we're going to hear about the project based in the country one of the US for this conference, Zambia. So I'm going to give the floor to uh, Ronald and Nelly from the URA. Um, I'm just going to briefly introduce both of them first. So Nelly Namikwago is the Assistant Commissioner for Research and Policy Design at the URA. And Ronald Weiswa is a supervisor of research and policy is a supervisor for research and policy analysis, also at the URA. So they're going to be presenting a project about taxing high net worth individuals. And so we're going to try to keep time because we have four presenters for this panel. So let's see if we can do it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, first of all, just like uh, as stated, it, is a, it has been a collaborative study between the Uganda Regional Authority and uh, the International Center for Tax and Open. And uh, the team largely included the uh, uh, URA staff, myself, Nili, uh, Susan, and Patrick, and then one from the International Center for Tax and Open, Jerry and Patrick. So why do we target the rich? Uh, first, because First of all, income tax is largely uh, untapped in Africa and Uganda specifically. I, I think I should tell you one truth that uh, in African development communities, there are three segments of taxpayers that I think they fear tax the rich, politicians, and government agencies. <laughs> I think we just fear to tax them to impose on them. Uh, in Uganda, for example, if you remove employees, our personal income taxes account for less than 1% of domestic taxes. In terms of administration, these agencies are largely imposed in corporations and not in various generally. And the operation of the rich is growing, fueled by the increasing industrialization, FBI's and population growth. The numbers are increasing everywhere, in Zambia, in Kenya, everywhere in the world, the rich are growing. Uh, these individuals, they invest a lot offshore. The private rates in 139 countries, for example, accumulated between 73 trillion dollars, 7.3 trillion dollars to 9.3 trillion dollars in unrecorded offshore wealth. And these financial flows are also common among them. Like I stated, poor countries are not collecting taxes from the rich and the politically connected compared to the developed countries. So in terms of the objectives, uh, we purpose to, to first identify whether we have potential high for the individuals in Uganda and to analyze our strength in terms of the legal structure and administrative structure to tax this segment of taxpayers. And in phase two, we try to come up with a criteria to identify them and to assess the URA approach in taxing them and then to come up with some recommendations for most of the African countries. In terms of approach, we had interviews with quite a number of people within the URA and various government institutions. And then we did, we went into the URA datasets, the internal URA datasets in our systems, as well as datasets from our sister organizations within government. And then we did text analysis where we're looking at our domestic tax laws, the academic articles, the lifestyle magazines, the budget speeches, etc. And then we visited a number of other revenue authorities that have at least made a step to tax high level individuals. That effect, we visited uh, the SAS, that is South Africa, uh, HMRC, the ATO, the and then the Mauritius. In Africa, apart from South Africa and Mauritius, I think we don't have revenue authorities that are purposed to tax high level individuals, apart from Uganda, that also started recently. In terms of findings, one, the high net worth individuals, we find them in all sectors of the economy. Most of them are in the wholesale sector, they are traders in Ghana's case, but those with the highest potential are operating in the financial and insurance sector. And then those in the, uh, and then the real estate sector, as we see in the next slides, even if most of them are wholesalers, 
or some of them are within the government, their proceeds appear to be invested in real estate and other buildings. We have professionals and those that offer technical services. For example, we're looking at um, the, 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 the magazine, the CEO magazine, where they profile the rich in Africa. And few of the eleven billionaires for that magazine were really were basically professionals, two lawyers and one doctor, including some of the professors here. They get those huge contracts, they get the money, and they will not turn up to pay the tax level. We have those coming from construction, and surprisingly, those with the lowest paychecks, eh? the government officials, they have the smallest paychecks, but they have potential high net worth employees. Where they get the money, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of finance, um, just like I said earlier, they invest heavily in the real estate sector. I already said that many are traders, but their proceeds appear to be invested in land and buildings. And in Africa, and Uganda particularly, it is very easy to acquire this property. You can invest a property in your kid's name, so you can have a kid who is yet to be born, having a total business in the town. They invest so much offshore. Uh, if you remember the 2015 leaking in, um, in uh, the HCBS Swiss subsidiary, 51 of them, of those clans, were associated with Uganda, and they are definitely quite a lot of money outside there. Then in Uganda, the high level of individuals are policy makers, who can influence policy. Those VIPs, the very important persons, the politicians, they are high level individuals. If they are not high level individuals, they have the authority and the power to influence policy. Um, and we also realize that in Africa and Uganda in particular, they are facing very little pressure to pay taxes. So these rich at times, they will not go outside to, to invest because of the taxation pressure but maybe because of the th fear of risks of insecurity, not the pressure to tax them. And the way they hide their wealth, it is in less sophisticated methods. They will put it in properties, which we see, but we just fear to tax them. And then they will do outright misdeclarations and underdeclarations, and at times, bribing officials. More complex tax planning, used by a very small group of these, Then for URA, we, it took a bold step to tax the three lions to tax administration. I already stated that they include the government entities, they don't pay, the VIPs, those politicians, and the high net worth individuals. So URA took an initiative to tax high net worth individuals. Uh, that was in 2015 when we had just completed the first phase of this study. After showing them the results, they took up the initiative. They formed a high net worth individual unit that uh, initially started with about 117 potential high net worth individuals. And at that time, they basically approached these individuals on the education side. They wanted to educate them on their taxpayer rights, ETC, not on uh, grounds of enforcement. Um, currently, we are, they merged the unit, so we, they are dealing with the high net worth individual and the very important persons. Those largely include the politicians. Uh, they are now uh, under one unit, under the public sector office. So who is a high net worth individual? Now, in the context of an African country, and I should also tell you this, that there is no clear definition on who a high net worth individual is, universally. So there is no universally accepted definition. Where the reports will put it at um, $1 million, South Africa has its own definition, and in Uganda, and most African countries, we propose a multi-parameter criteria. You will not find a one threshold to define a high net worth individuals, largely because of the high information virtue. Getting information on taxpayers in an African setting is, is very difficult. We don't have those systems. So in terms of Uganda, to identify a rich in Uganda, we propose a multi-parameter criteria where we are looking at land just because they invest heavily there and we put a threshold on land. We have those uh, that are shareholders in the large taxpayer companies. We also put those as a key parameter. These parameters are in two, two. We have what we call the core. So for the core parameter, as long as you meet one of them, you're qualified to be a high net worth individual. And there's the non-core, those are in yellow. You need to meet at least two of them. We tested the criteria because of time I'll not go through this. I'll share the slides. 
But in terms of achievements, I think we have registered impressive results on the side of URA. We have now at least a, a register of VIPs that includes largely politicians and an updated register for high net worth individuals, at least up to now. And in terms of fighting, the high net worth individuals, only about 13% of them were fighting, and we see this increasing significantly to 78% in income tax paid were not fighting, but at least now 84% filed their own pay and then VAT. Then VIPs, those that they had even never filed, but at least we saw them starting to file their income tax returns. In terms of revenue, we, in that financial and the other financial, we on the total collected about 40 billion Ugandan shillings. And ULA has also taken a bold step to, to enforce on them through audits. And uh, in that financial, I think it was 16, 17, they audited only five and were able to identify and agree with the taxpayers on a tax of about 1.4 billion Uganda shillings. In terms of increasing voluntary compliance, we still see that the revenue coming from uh, high net worth individuals is now relatively stable. Compared to, the, the, there is still a problem with the VIPs. Their compliance is still low. They will contribute this time and then they escape. They will not contribute in other financial. So we see the revenue relatively stable for high net worth individuals and a bit unfair and unstable for the policymakers, the VIPs. When we contrasted with other revenue authorities, those that we, we were able to contact, most of them at least at one point they had a high net worth individual. In some, they abolished it, but at least their system is in place to monitor their high net worth individuals. And then the same parameters that we are using, they are the same. They used to come up with their own thresholds. For them, like HMRC, they, have a specific, they had a specific criteria threshold, but which is not applicable to an African setting because of the information virtue. For URA, we are suggesting a multi-parameter criteria, and in URA, we include the VIPs. In South Africa, they have it as a separate unit. Then for lessons for other revenue authorities, I think we need to, to, to start with a deliberate effort to tax this class of individuals, the high net worth individuals, government institutions, and the VIPs. So it is at times important if you are going to take this direction to get the support of management, managements of even authorities really need to come up um, and support the initiative to tax the high net worth individuals. In Uganda, at times, I, I should say we have the support of management. In, in research, actually, we involve them. Me, I'm happy about Mira, she has the passion to write. So we get him on board and she writes. By the time you finish the paper, she understands, she has contributed to the entire paper. So when they are in their management meetings, she will tell them the truth. At times for us, we don't happen to, to attend those meetings. So they will not know this information. So what you need to do to make these researchers more effective, encourage them to be part of the writers. They will understand whatever is in those reports, they don't have time to read. So at times it's better if you engage them from the in, uh, identification of the problem, doing this whole thing. By the time they go in their management meetings, they'll be telling them what exactly they also saw in the findings. Then sometimes it is at times important to just begin with the rich information you have. Don't wait for perfect criteria. You may never reach there. It is a running process. Just begin. Even if you identified like 50, first begin with those ones. The free to revenue you're going to get from them will motivate you to even launch deeper in them. So don't wait for perfect things. Use public, public information. The rich are known. When you come to Zambia, you know your rich individuals. Stop saying we don't know the rich, we don't have a criteria. The rich are known. The rich are known, don't they? <laughs> they are known. The public knows these people. So, in fact, it was, um, I think, UK. They did a national identification of the high net worth individuals, and they found them. In fact, the problems are not only uh, specific to African countries. Even those developed countries have the same problems. When they did that survey, they, I think, identified an additional 40,000. And on scrutiny, they got about 2,000 that were more richer than those they had on the register. So, use public knowledge. Then you can do a national identification survey, HMRC did it, like I've just stated. Then technical expertise versus soft skills for URA, it is more, more of soft skills, less of enforcement. So you see these people have the, the powers to influence policy. They can change the policy rules. If you put a policy that affects them, they can change it. So at times, soft skills are much better in an African setting. Then enforcement can, of course, come later. More internal and external collaborations are needed. And then when you start these units, 
you need to then come to the recommendations that we are giving. You are eight, look into the, the staff requirements. We find that in HMRC, the ratio of staff to the high net worth individuals is one to 17. In Uganda, it was five, I think one to over 50. Then if, you, if possible, you need to hire from the private sector. Uh, SAS does that, and he told us that is one of the reasons for their success, hiring from the private sector. So if, for example, someone is dealing in telecom and you don't have the capacity to own such a person, then you hire from the telecom sector. Um, and then encouraging voluntary compliance. At times, enforcing on them may be successful, but it may not give you the results you want. So at times, it's more, more results may be achieved if it is more of uh, voluntary compliance. I, uh, because of time, I think I should say thank you and so there. Yeah. Thank you, Ronald, for sharing uh, insights on the creation of this special unit. Uh, so um, we have some time constraints, but as Ronald said, uh, the slides will be shared, so all of you will be able to appreciate them in more detail uh, afterwards. Um, uh, and maybe I can also say the papers are published on the ICTD website. They are there. In case you don't find them, you can still inbox us. We can send you the two papers. Perfect. Thank you. And Millie and Ronald will both be available afterwards for questions. But let me introduce the next speakers without further ado. Um, so the speakers from the Zambia Revenue Authority are Kelvin um, Pembamoto, who's the Assistant Director of Research and Policy at uh, the Zambia Revenue Authority, and Evaristo Mwale, who is a senior economist in charge of revenue forecasting and monitoring. And so they're going to be presenting work about personal income taxation. Uh, thank you. Um, the paper I'm about to present uh, is a paper which is meant to improve the administration of uh, pay as UN in the Zambia Revenue Authority. Um, maybe the, just by the way of preamble, um, in Zambia we have two types of uh, tax regimes for businesses. We have uh, a turnover tax for businesses that have a turnover of below 800,000. And the companies that have turnover above 800,000 are subject to company income tax. So in the course of reviewing the tax compliance for our taxpayers, we realized that uh, under the turnover tax, we found that a number of companies were just filing in the turnover tax returns and payments, but they were not submitting uh, any form of pay as you and return. So we did uh, an investigation we, we, ran, uh, we ran the database for turnover tax to just isolate companies on those, uh, uh, from that database. And we tried to compare their filing behavior under the PAYE. Yeah, so basically the objective of the study was to establish the potential firms to target for PE registration from that database, estimate the potential number of potential taxpayers who can be identified, and also estimate the potential PAYE that we could collect from, from that population, and also make some policy recommendations. The basic assumption from the study was that uh, the non-compliers had a sort of similar behavior or a similar character as the, the, the firms which were complying. Um, so the total number of, uh, in terms of the key findings of the studies, that uh, the total number of employees that were uncovered uh, was about 171,000. And uh, for gone revenues, was around 23 million with an average payee rate of 137 uh, per employee. I must state that the assumptions here were that uh, the behavior of uh, the non-compliant firms was similar to, to the compliant uh, businesses in terms of the number of employees, uh, the, the payouts, the pay, the pay wage. And uh, we are also uh, assuming that uh, once the compliance action is taken on, the, on those non-compliant taxpayers, they, they, that would result in like 100% uh, compliance. And of course, uh, if 
but all the compliant taxpayers that we were mimicking are not actually compliant, then maybe this 23 would actually be an underestimate. <clears throat> so in terms of the study methodology, we use the micro data level from the PAYE and turnover tax returns from uh, October 2013 to, to May 2017. But for purposes of this study, this study was done last year, and uh, so we, we had to use the 2016 uh, figures to, to establish our, our numbers. So the first thing we did in the study was to determine the compliant firms. So what we did was to, each taxpayer has got a, a unique identifier, which is the tip-in. So we tried to, to find the tip-ins which were matching uh, under the TOT, uh, against those tippings which were under the PAYE. So the tippings which we are merging, that is the group which was called the compliant uh, taxpayers. Similarly, we took the tippings for, for those entities who's, uh, who were not matching or merging with the tippings on the PAYE but had similar characteristics to those who were both compliant on the, on the, on the PAYE as well as TOT, and this is what we call the targeted group. So when it comes to the estimation of the, the number of employees, so the number of employees uncovered, we use the average number of employees from the compliant uh, basket and uh, multiplied that by the total number of returns that were filed by these same non-compliant taxpayers. So that sort of provided the total number of employees that were potentially, that could potentially be declared at an annual level. Uh, in estimating the, the tax collectible, potentially, we again had to multiply the average monthly payee from the compliant firms, and then we had to multiply that by the number of tax returns which uh, these uh, non-compliant firms were submitting. So after doing that, then we were able to declare the, the potential taxes. I will still walk you through the remainder of the submission. Well, good morning, once more. I am Evaristo Mare to take you through the rest of the presentation. So I'll quickly run you through the descriptive statistics of the payee and turnover tax data sets. Then I'll take you through the merging results of the study. So um, the table there presents the, the results of the payees in data sets from uh, 2014 to 2016. And uh, you can see that uh, the mean salary, the, uh, in 2016 was about uh, 8,576, and the median was, uh, was 2,489. Uh, we computed the average frame size uh, that characterized the, the, the PE data set, and uh, you can see that from the graph, there was a, a very gradual decrease in the average frame size from about 43 to 40 from 2014 to from 2014 to, to, to 2016. And you can see that the median size remained constant at about nine. Then uh, the unique number of uh, employers, you can see that there's been a gradual increase in the unique number of employers filing the pay as you in and that's been increasing from uh, 2014 all the way up to 2016. Then the, the summary of the gross sales, that is on the turnover taxes, you can see that uh, the, the number of, of, of observation were about 153,000. And uh, from this, we can see that um, the median gross sales in 2016 was about 4,000 and the mean was about 15,345. Uh, I'll take you through the merging results now. 
uh, when we made the turnover text database and the pay, the, the pay databases, you can see that the merge results increased from 7.6% in 2014, in 2013 to about 12.6% in 2017. So, and the first finding of this result is that our companies were the predominant uh, uh, firms that, that, that followed, that, that merged. And the second was that uh, these companies are highly located in Dusaka, Kitwe, and Dola, the, the large cities. And uh, it was established that the potential group that we target uh, in this study was actually the, a group of companies that did not file uh, pay as you in on the sitting on the turnover, the turnover tax database. And um, the graph there shows you the numbers in terms of the companies which actually file for pay and those which actually do not file. And you can see that the line in graph is actually the number, which is the target group. And you can see that uh, the numbers for, for this group are actually higher. And in 2016, there were actually about 6,000 of these companies who are actually not paying pay, pay, pay taxes. Uh, to estimate the potential number of employees that we can recover from the target group, uh, we first uh, do the distribution analysis of the filing behavior of the firms, of, of the target firm and the firm which is compliant. And we can see in green that the filing of the non-compliant group is actually higher than the group which is actually paying. Uh, in addition, uh, we constructed the average number of employees against monthly turnover for the compliant group. And you can see that um, uh, with turnovers of above 60,000 quarter, the average number of employees per firm size is, uh, is, is actually eight. And for, for, the, for the firms below, with a turnover of below 60,000 quarter, the average firm size is around four. So the total number of employees that could be uncovered from all returns was estimated by multiplying the average number of, of employees from the compliant firms times the number of returns from the non-compliant firms. And the results are displayed in that graph. And you, it's interesting to see that in absolute terms, the largest number of potential employees are concentrated, are concentrated among taxpayers with, uh, with smallest month return over. And uh, the total number of potential employees, as uh, Mr. Kelvin uh, alluded to, is uh, 1,707. Then uh, we estimate the total potential pay that can be covered from, this, from, from the target group. We first construct the average pay against the monthly turnover for the merged sample. And um, it's interesting also to see that uh, the average pay for, for firms with turnovers of above 60,000 quarter is around 1,000 quarter. And for those below the turnover of 60,000 quarter is below 1,000 quarter. So the total pay that could be, be uncovered across all returns was estimated by multiplying the average monthly pay from the compliant firms by the number of month returns from the non-compliant firms, and the graph displayed the results. Just like in the other graph, you can see that in absolute terms, the largest uh, amount of pay is concentrated among taxpayers with smallest month return over. And the total potential pay to be uncovered was around 23.4 million quarter per annum. So uh, to conclude, uh, in 2016, only 11.8% of all returns in the turnover data, in the, in the TOT database, were compliant for pay. And companies are actually the predominant of these firms. Then the key characteristics of the compliant groups were the average number of employees were 8.3, and their monthly pay was 1,233. And uh, the average month wages to month turnover was about 16%. And in total, this group of companies paid uh, about 18 million 
in 2016 as, as, as pay taxes. Then under the assumptions that the non-complier frames have similar characteristics with the, with the complier frames, uh, we estimate the total number of uncovered employees at 171 and seven employees, and total amount of annual pay taxes to be 23.4 million. Uh, when you grow this number to 2018, it translates to about 29 million. Then uh, there are three sets of recommendation that emerge from this analysis. The first one is in increasing compliance enforcement, there is need to target the taxpayers that file on round numbers, like uh, 10,000 quarts or 9,000 quarts. Then um, second one, target identified nine complier groups of firms who file month turnover between 90,000 quarts and 150,000 quarts. This is because the taxpayers state to underreport their turnovers while there are counterparts in the complier group often pay taxes. And the last recommendation was to propose systematic TOT pay cross match to integrate TOT risk element into the pay audits. With this, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, so in addition to the speakers, Millie and Enders are also going to be available for the Q&A session. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Meruk Fanga, coming from the organization called Action Governance Forum within Lusaka. My question goes to Kelvin. That was a nice presentation. Uh, I wanted to find out how did you work with the media and the civil society organization when it comes into, uh, into police taxes? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mbsonda from ActionAid. My question goes to our colleagues from the Uganda Revenue Authority. I just wanted to find out, with regards to taxation of high net worth individuals, how has been the buy-in, or let me put it the other way, the political will? Then also, how is the support from other sectors that are relevant to taxation of high net worth individuals? Uh, for instance, you mentioned the criteria that you use, land among others. So how are other government agencies uh, working together with yourselves as the Uganda Revenue Authority? Then lastly also, how has been uh, government support uh, to your operations? Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, my name is Kuzose. I'm from the Zambia Revenue Authority. Uh, Ronald, I've got three questions. Uh, in your tax taxation of uh, high net worth individuals, firstly, how are you able to access certain information? For example, you mentioned that most of them uh, hide their wealth in uh, land, building, do you have an interface, for example, like with other government um, ministries, for example, maybe the Ministry of Finance, to give you information on uh, certain high net worth in individuals and the properties that they own? Uh, secondly, in terms of um, interview, when, you, when you're conducting an audit, for example, on a high net worth individual, I would like you to shed some light on uh, interview techniques because most of the time the information that is given to you is what you rely on in terms of uh, coming up with an audit assessment. So um, I would like you to just, I see a very advanced, Zambia has a population of about 40, identified about 40 high net worth individuals. So maybe shed some light on your interview techniques on high net worth individuals. And then thirdly, do you have a specific unit under the Ugandan Revenue Authority that handles like a high net worth individual unit? Or is it, um, is it part of maybe one of your, either your large taxpayer or your medium taxpayer? Do you have specific people that are actually dealing with this type of uh, sector? Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, action aid, uh, the political will, and support from other sectors, other government agencies. I think I'll handle, I'll handle these in unison and just give a brief explanation on how we're implementing this. 
Uh, one, um, we already said that the legislation is available. The legislation is available, but in our revenue authorities, there was that fear. And Ronald brought that out. So using the legislation that is available, we are enforcing, but the way we are enforcing, and that will address both the interview techniques and support from other sectors. We are using the information we have available in our databases. Uh, one of the things we collect is stamp duty on land transactions. So we do the analysis within our databases and empower our staff who are in the high net worth individuals unit to use this information to interact with these high net worth individuals. So when they interact with them in form of interview, they come from a point of knowledge. When I come to you and explain to you that I know you have this property and that property and the other property, and this is in your son's names and the other one. So it's very difficult for you not to listen to me. So this stuff I empowered with this information. But again, like Ronald said, we are using so much more of the soft skills. So we do an analysis of our stakeholders. If these uh, individuals are in the public offices, then we, we identify whether they would like to speak directly to the Commissioner General or they would like to speak to the commissioner, or some, because of religion, will not like to speak to ladies. So we do that detailed analysis and try to, to come down to their likes. Then another thing we are doing, we do not publish their information. So the information remains between us and them. And like Rona would say, they are very influential. So if you try to publish them among the, the, the taxpayers that are defaulting and all that, then you probably get a backlash. So we don't publish at the moment and we approach them from a point of knowledge. Then we have information from other government agencies. We are not automatically linked, but we try our best to collect this information and try to analyze it manually. While Ronald and Tim were doing this study, they had a lot of manual data matching to try and establish and that's one of the areas we're looking at. We are, we are looking for development partner support, government support, to see that our databases from the various agencies can speak to each other, because that is one of the areas that would help us very much. So also we have a specific unit that is handling high net worth and, uh, and uh, VIPs, because we found that for Uganda's case, these two have, similar characteristics, so they are both in one unit. However, one of the challenges we still have is, is the, the soft skills. Most of our staff, because they are tax collectors, they do not yet have those soft skills, and that's one of the areas that Ronald talked about that SARS shared with us. For them, they get from the private sector. So we always get that uh, challenge of going out hard, and yet these people, you need to first study them very well have all the information about them. We, we also have the tax investigations that is working with exchange of information. So when we get information from that side as well, we, we use that to try and address some of these areas. I hope I've taken care of most of the questions. I just want to bring out one issue that it's very important that the research function works very closely with the operations. And for us, that, that's the trick. I know in a number of uh, organizations and even researchers, before we started working with them, once someone has their paper and it has the methodology and what, they really don't care, they'll publish it and then it's up to you. For us, we took another twist, is that we work very closely with the operations. So we're doing this study as the operations are also experimenting. So by the end of the day, we even had results and ownership for some of the presentations we actually present with our commissioner domestic taxes, because this is in directly in his area. So we found that this is very beneficial. So as we look at collaborating with um, international and local researchers internally in the revenue authorities, let's look at close, close collaboration with the operations. Let's not carry out researches that are just for publishing, but will really help 
and are bought in by the operating departments. And then very quickly, we've, we've worked with Kenya. Kenya also wants to bring on high net worth individuals. I think they've attempted once or twice. And, and Joseph, I'm sorry, but I'll share this. We advised Kenya that do not first put all methodology and all that. You just start. But somehow I think they wanted to first get everything moving. And that is why they delayed move. I believe now they've taken on the other. You know, these things, you don't have to be perfect. You just start and get moving and learn along the way. As long as you document what you're doing, then you'll be able to follow up, correct it, and improve it continuously. Then we've also supported Ghana. Am I right? Ghana Revenue Authority has also started on high net worth individuals. Thank you. Um, our relationship with the media is, uh, is cordial. We, we view the media as a, a medium through which uh, we can be able to disseminate tax information to our taxpayers, and in that way, that would enhance our tax compliance levels. You may wish to know that uh, uh, Zambia Revenue Authority does conduct uh, media workshops uh, with the media team, at which we invite various stakeholders to give uh, lectures to, to, to media personnel on how to report on tax matters and related business issues. We recently signed an MOU with the Zambia National Broadcasting Corporation uh, through through, well, I mean, we, we, we hope that uh, through that uh, MOU, which we did, we'll be able to disseminate uh, tax information to our taxpayers. Uh, occasionally, our Commissioner General does have uh, press briefings at which members of the press are invited to seek clarity on issues surrounding tax, and that gives them an opportunity to get clarifications on any matters that are, are topical around tax. So, in a nutshell, I would say that. Uh, the media is very much part and parcel of our tax administration. And we have a huge budget, a robust PRI unit, which works uh, very hand in hand with, uh, with the media. Thank you. And pre uh, probably to speak for the operations, because I've been in ZRA for as long as it has existed, that's 24 years. Uh, we, we, we have um, actually made a lot of strides in terms of um, transformation of the taxes. We are coming from the position where each and every uh, taxpayer, regardless of size, were required to file in a tax return. Fast forward, today we're talking about um, turnover tax payers you earn. Because a few years ago, we could not even imagine taxing uh, turnover tax individuals. Now, when you talk about turnover tax individuals, we're talking about Annual tax rate, annual tax um, uh, turnover of 80,000 US dollars. That's 800,000 kwacha. So 80,000 US dollars divided by 12, you're talking about 6.6, .6, okay, 7,000 US dollars per month. So these are very tiny businesses. Now, if you're going to talk about, um, um, of course, the research department, very relevant to our business. We didn't have them 10 years ago, for instance. We now have a fully fledged research department. They've brought in, um, uh, they, they targeted this research topic. Very, very well researched, guys. Congratulations. But my considered view is that um, we're looking at 6,000, 7,000 US dollars per month businesses. Later on, looking at their. Um, um, pay as you and issues, meaning even smaller volumes. It might, uh, it, it, I look at it as very ambitious, but I congratulate you for the focus. Thank you.